Good evening, and welcome to Masterminds 2022, the Zoom edition. Uh, to begin, and on behalf of uh, Masterminds and this evening's presenter, I want to acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen speaking peoples on whose unceded territories the University of Victoria stands and the Esquimalt, Songhees, and Saanich peoples with whom we share this wonderful place on the earth. The Mastermind series is an initiative uh, to foster university community engagement by providing the public high quality lectures from the University of Victoria. The series began in 2007 uh, and since that time has presented over 60 thoughtful <clears throat> and thought provoking lectures uh, during that time. Tonight's will certainly add to that record of excellence. The Mastermind series is comprised of four lectures, one on each evening in April. Each lecture is created and delivered by the University of Victoria retiree on a topic of their expertise and of general community interest. Each year, the series is developed by a collaboration of the University uh, of Victoria's Retirees Association, the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health, and the University's Media Relations and Public Affairs Group. And I should mention, Leah Potter, who is uh, behind the scenes running the show this evening, uh, is, plays a pivotal role in the development and delivery of this series. And as you no doubt realize, uh, we're into a Zoom format. Um, it used to be before the pandemic, uh, live lectures on campus. Uh, but the Zoom seems to be working out fairly well. Just a few words on the Zoom format. Um, your audio will be muted, uh, but questions can be asked, submitted rather, I guess you'd say, uh, uh, on Zoom. If you go down to the bottom of your screen, your Zoom screen, and just to the right of center, there's a Q&A uh, icon. And if you click on that, you can, you can uh, type in your question and they will be, uh, answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, this event is being recorded uh, and will be posted on YouTube and uploaded to the websites of the uh, Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health and the Retirees Association. And now to the presentation. It's my honor and pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Emeritus Phil Dearden, uh, a geographer uh, specializing in conservation. His, uh, his research is focused on tropical conservation with projects centering in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and more recently, East Asia, spanning both marine and terrestrial environments. He, he has published uh, extensively over 300 academic articles, 11 books, and two textbooks which are standard in Canadian universities, and in addition, has supervised uh, about 100 graduate students in his area. He's a member of the World Parks Commission and has advised many international bodies and nat uh, sorry, national governments on environmental uh, management. On top of all this, he is a sailor and a gardener uh, living on Salt Spring Island. The uh, Community-based conservation, his topic this evening, uh, offers great opportunities for not only uh, countering biodiversity loss, but also helping improve nat rural communities, living standards, and st sustainability. And this is pretty topical given the report that came out this week uh, on uh, uh, the climate crisis. His presentation uh, weaves a narrative of uh, field case studies from Southeast Asia that illustrates some of the challenges and opportunities of community-based conservation, emphasizing the need to take geographical approach based on understanding communities, their needs, aspirations, and environment on an individual base rather than a philosophical mantra. Dr. Dearden, over to you. Thank you so much, John. Um, just let me get clicked in here.
So thank you very much, John, and thank you for everybody else uh, joining us uh, tonight for this chat. And thanks to Leah for doing her backstopping of this and uh, making sure that things are going to work okay. So as John said, tonight I'm going to talk about my last 40 years of research uh, based almost exclusively in the tropics, talking about community conservation. Uh, but first I want to start with a acknowledgement um, of territory where I'm speaking from. I respectfully acknowledge that I live and I'm talking to you tonight from Salt Spring Island within the ancestral and unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people. This is particularly important for my topic tonight because it's understanding the past, present and future contributions of indigenous people uh, to conservation that I think holds the main key for our hope for the future. And so this is a very um, appropriate um, acknowledgement. There are other people I would like to acknowledge. I would like to uh, acknowledge my uh, many students over the years who've uh, sit and uh, debated and asked questions and generally uh, kept me thinking outside the box. I've often mused that um, the university system really has got it down that, uh, that they pay us, come and sit to listen to us, but actually I should be paying them uh, so that they would come and listen to me. So I'm very grateful for the, for the system that allows this to happen. As you'll hear tonight, a lot of my research has involved my co-researchers, my graduate students, and I thank them all for their, their work, often in very harsh conditions, um, especially when they return to UVic. Uh, but their initiative and drive and hardiness that sees them through. So thank you to all my graduate students. I'd like to thank geography, firstly as a discipline, because tonight I'm talking about real people uh, and real situations on the ground. I'm talking about place. And geography is the study of place. And it's the study of how places change over time. So I, I'd like to thank and acknowledge my disciplinary heritage uh, for that perspective, as well as the Department of Geography at University, uh, University of Victoria and some of my mentors there, especially Mike Edgell, Colin Wood and Derek Sewell, who were very influential uh, in, in my early years at UVic. I'd also like to thank UVic, which provided a very convivial um, environment over the years for my, uh, for my work, for my studies and for my students. We have had many community partners ranging from China through to Mexico, uh, but mostly in Southeast Asia, South, uh, South Asia and Africa. And I'd like to thank them for their uh, cooperation and again, their initiative and what we have learned from them. And finally, I'd like to thank my family uh, for their encouragement, uh, for the times that uh, I have gone away and for the many, many times that they have come with me together and the many adventures that we have shared during the course of our research. So I would like to start with this. Now, those of you who have read the abstract and were listening to John would say, ha, calls himself a geographer, he's already off topic because I said this would weave a narrative about Southeast Asia. But I decided we would start here in Northern Tanzania uh, because this is very recent. It came across my desk a couple of weeks ago uh, and it also epitomizes the subject that I want to talk about tonight uh, in Asia and globally. So this was an appeal. We are Maasai elders from Northern Tanzania. Any day now, tens of thousands of our community could be evicted from our ancestral lands to make way for tourism and trophy hunting. Last time, Avaz raised the alarm. And I'll tell you, Avaz is a large, reputedly the largest uh, in the world uh, activism network based in New York. Last time Avaz raised the alarm, the president shelved the plan, so we urgently need you to stand with us again. 
Our new president is attending an a, a Europe-African summit in Brussels in hours, and global public pressure can change her mind that time is running out. Time now to help us protect our lands. So the situation here is not quite as simple as it would seem from this appeal on social media. So it's a very, very complex problem. And what I will be talking about tonight are various strategies about how we get greater understanding about optimal solutions to these kinds of challenges. But first, a little more background about uh, this case. Um, I felt justified in putting it in here, even though I said I would talk about Southeast Asia, because I am familiar with Northern Tanzania and with the uh, Maasai people and uh, the area that we're talking about here. So we're talking about Gorongoro uh, Crater in Northern Tanzania. These are some of those elite tourists uh, going to head down to the crater. Um, they are the students in a field school that I led to this area two or three years ago uh, with my colleague, Dr. Bruce Downey um, over here, who is a real Tanzanian expert. So Gorongoro Crater is perhaps the epitome of global uh, terrestrial large mammal diversity that we have. And so it has been recognized for this and is a World Heritage Site. And I think you'll be familiar uh, with most of the characters, the Thompson's gazelle, uh, the zebra, the lion, uh, many, many species to be found down in this crater. It is a World Heritage Site. It was created in 1959 and not as a national park. It was created as an area where the human inhabitants and the animals could live in some kind of symbiosis. Now, the Maasai, are, this is not really their ancestral territory. Um, it was the Dakoga and the Hazadi who first settled these lands and were uh, the dominant people here up to about 200 years ago. But since that time, it has been dominated by the Maasai pastoralists. And this seemed like an ideal arrangement because unlike many of the other ethnic groups in East Africa, they do not eat wildlife. They do not kill wildlife. They do not poach wildlife. So they are livestock pastoralists. And so this seemed like an ideal arrangement. When the agreement was signed for this multiple land use, there were 8,000 Maasai in the area and about 160,000 livestock. By the year 2020, that had grown to uh, 117,000 Maasai, from 8,000 to 117,000, and from, uh, and from 116,000 wildlife up to 800,000 wildlife, uh, wild livestock. So you can see that the numbers had changed drastically in this period. And the Maasai have one of the highest birth rates in the world, about 3.5%. Uh, so this has created a real conflict in this area and a conflict that is uh, not amenable to simple solutions. It's a conflict that has to be studied closely and with, uh, with, with great um, attention to detail. Now the government looking at this problem, commissioned this report undertaken by uh, Tanzanian uh, academics and scientists, and they put forward five um, options. One of their major findings was that the quality of the range in Gorongoro was declining rapidly because of overgrazing. And that because of that, uh, the numbers of wildlife and the numbers of cattle would not be able to support it in the future. So in fact, the people are getting poorer in the crater and the wildlife is getting poorer and in lower numbers in the crater. 
So this model did not seem to be working. So they put forward five options and the government has elected to go with a middle option. And the middle option is to increase the size of the protected area, to expand the area and try to spread the people out into a larger area and provide protection for wildlife over a larger area. So it's a complicated, uh, very complicated problem, but it does epitomize many of the challenges uh, that we are facing in the world today. And that's what I want to talk to about. And I will come back to this uh, problem later on. So this is really symptomatic of the silent extinction. Here it's talking about uh, giraffes. The numbers of giraffes have fallen by 40% over the last uh, 30 years. And one of the main reasons is, uh, as it says here, people moving into giraffe areas and, uh, and displacing the animals. So who would think that the giraffe uh, would become extinct? So you can look at this as the big squeeze. And the way government has reacted to the big squeeze is to establish protected areas such as national parks, areas of high biodiversity value where we put the needs of nature above those of humans. So this contributes to the overall challenge of global extinction. This is the latest report by the IPBES, the International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, um, the International UN panel, and they tell us that over a million species are threatened uh, with extinction. And so this is a very serious and global problem. So I'm going to provide some context for this problem and how we think about it by reference to this diagram. So if you look at the top right-hand corner, biosphere people, e ecosystem people. So this categorization was something that I borrowed from a American conservationist, Ray Dasman, um, that he wrote a paper on maybe 35, 40 years ago. And Dasman said, he said, there are two main kinds of people on this world. The biosphere people get their resources from wherever they can, from around the world. When they exhaust one area, they go to another area. When they exhaust that, they go to another area. We are the biosphere people. He said, in contrast, we have ecosystem people. The ecosystem people get their goods, services, livelihoods from the ecosystem that they live in. If they don't take care of that ecosystem, then there are direct repercussions for their livelihoods, for their future, for their children and their children's children. So they tend to take care of what they're doing within there. So the biosphere people, in other words, us, the kinds of things that we do means that we have high ecosystem impacts, which means that in the lands that we use, biodiversity tends to be low. So as biosphere people began to realize that uh, a good proportion of the world was no longer in a natural condition, they started to think that maybe something should be protected. And so they started looking around for areas that were not uh, ruined by our own activities. And so to find those areas, they had to go over to the lands of the ecosystem people. Because they were the people where there was low impacts and still high biodiversity. So in a geographical sense, in space, we went across here and created parks in the lands of the ecosystem people. Now, there are two challenges to this. Uh, that's the geographical context, but the time context. Ecosystem people are not frozen in time. They are not in a museum. 
they also want some of the benefits of development that we enjoy. And so in time, their impacts are increasing and they are gradually coming down the scale towards being biosphere people. At the same time, as we run out of areas to exploit, we are squeezing this land base up here further and further into the lands of the ecosystem people. So this is the big squeeze that's happening upon the land base. So what to do? So the biosphere people seeing this, seeing their parks starting to change, starting to see these high impacts, said to their governments, because governments work the biosphere people, they said, we got to get those people out of there. We got to relocate those people. They're ruining our parks. On the other hand, advocates for the ecosystem people, such as NGOs, said, you know, you've only got those parks because we know what we're doing. We looked after our lands. That's why the ecosystem impacts alone. We believe that ecosystem people should have rights of residency and be able to do what they want. So that's where we are with the Maasai at the moment. And unfortunately, the dialogue over this last 20, 30 years has been people choosing one of these camps on an idealistic basis, ideology, and lobbing grenades over to the other one. So we have taken in our work a little bit of a different context here, uh, in that we have accepted the need for both poles reluctantly. But we've also accepted that there is a management continuum of interventions between them, whereby we can work things out about how we can accommodate the needs of both the ecosystem people and the needs of biodiversity conservation. So that's what I'm going to talk about mainly tonight, some of the studies that we've done along this continuum and how they relate to uh, this seeming dichotomy and how things can be uh, can, can work to more optimal solutions. So I said I would talk mainly about Southeast Asia, so here we are. So much of my research career, my early research career in the 80s and 90s, I spent in these highlands here, and it's there's where we will go first. Then we'll come down to Ratnakiri province here in uh, northeastern Cambodia for a little example. Then we will come down to these islands here. This is Thailand, this is Myanmar. And we'll go up into these islands for a little adventure, and then we'll end up in the Philippines. That is my plan. So let's turn to the highlands in northern Thailand. So the people in the highlands, the ethnic minorities of the highlands, uh, earn their livelihood through slash and burn agriculture. Nutrients are in the trees. You need to access those nutrients into the poor soils so you can grow your crops. So they burn the forest, release the nutrients, and grow their crops. Sooner or later, those nutrients leach out of the soils, the weeds become higher than the crop, and that particular opening, that particular Sweden, is abandoned and a new one is cut. So this system has worked for centuries, for thousands of years throughout the tropics. Uh, it's based upon the richness of the biomass and the poverty of the soils. What it ends up with is a landscape like this, where you have bites out of the forest that are then abandoned, and then another one cut. The system works well when there are few people in large areas. It does not work well when there are a lot of people in small areas. And that's exactly what has been happening in northern Thailand and many areas throughout Highland. Southeast Asia. So one story here about some early work we did in the 1980s in a national park in northern Thailand will illustrate some of these uh, challenges. This is Doi Inthinan National Park. 
It was established in 1954. At one time, it looked like this, very rich uh, tree flora. Now, most of it looks like this. So we decided to do an analysis of deforestation in the park and find out when this had happened. Now in this map, all the white areas are forest and everything that is not white has been uh, transformed into a grass field. So in theory, let's put it this way, uh, this whole area should be white. And you can see quite clear that it is not. Before the park was established, there was this one area here that had been deforested. And since it was established, all the rest of this area has been deforested. So this deforestation after the park was created is very similar to the pressures that are happening now in, in Gorongoro Crater. And it's not just these two case studies, this very recent IUCN study says, this is what's happening through the world. Most of these uh, pressures are occurring after the protected area was designated. And it gives you how much um, going from low pressure to intense human pressure category after the area was, uh, was designated. So a global problem. But let's look at some of the details. So in Doyintanen, there are two main ethnic groups. Uh, these are the settlement of one of the ethnic groups, the Karen people. And you can see in this, uh, in this uh, slide here, that this is not just cut and run Sweden agriculture. They have invested considerable energy in creating uh, terraces for wet rice. And in fact, this village was created in the park before the park was created. So it's important to understand the people, their history, their livelihoods and their impacts. The Karen people are very conservation minded and they're also very community oriented. They take many decisions as a community as a whole rather than individual families or just the headmen. So this is different from the other main ethnic group there, the Hmong. Uh, and the Hmong are primary Swidners, which means they prefer to cut down primary forest. Now, where most of the primary forest is gone, the only places left are the, uh, the national parks. And this park was particularly hard hit because it was encouraged um, due to opium replacement. So, but they have a very different philosophy on life uh, than the Karen do. And if you're working with these different groups, you've got to understand the kinds of motivations that they have. But one common motivation is poverty. So the household surveys that we did showed that in total, 37%, um, almost 50% of the people had insufficient money. If you have to raise a loan, you can't go to the bank here. The bank is the local money lender and the local money lender has very high rates of interest. To pay that back, the only source of uh, possible wealth that they can get is to cut down more forest and more animals. And so poverty is a main driver um, of this degradation of the forest here. So since the park was created, these animals have all been extirpated from that park. The gibbon, the bantang, uh, the great hornbill, I think you know this guy, the tiger, the elephant, and, and the rhinoceros. So not very successful as an area for protecting biodiversity. So this gives rise to the concept of the fortress park. And the fortress park is one where we design an area and we just stop the people doing those things. We stop any cultivation and we stop any poachers. And to do so, we do it mainly by force. And so this is a very typical photograph um, of a Thai ranger team going out on patrol in a national park uh, where they are very likely to come across uh, illegal activities and they're all fairly heavily armed. So the Fortress Park comes in for a lot of criticism, uh, not least from me, 
But we have to remember that when Roosevelt created uh, the world's first national park in 1872, Yellowstone, that he had to send in the cavalry to protect the last remaining herd of buffalo, plains buffalo, uh, left in North America. Had he not done so, we would have had no free-ranging bison herd left uh, in the continent. So, yes, the fortress park has a place, but can we do better? Does it work? Well, a couple of examples here. This is one about the last uh, Javan uh, rhino uh, in Southeast Asia that was poached from a fortress park, Cat Tien, uh, in Vietnam uh, about a decade ago. Uh, there's only one small population now remaining, and that is in Indonesia. Another example here uh, is the Sariska National Park Tiger Reserve. Uh, which did have 15 tigers, and all of them were poached uh, despite the protection. I know this very well because I took a field school uh, geography students there about 10 years ago now uh, to see the tigers, and all the tigers had gone. But there was some good news. We went back the year afterwards, and we found that tigers had been reintroduced. Now, this is, not, this is a very major thing for tigers. They're very difficult to reintroduce, unlike lions. And so this was one of the first in the world where there had been a successful reintroduction of a breeding population. Good news. And now we see that the rangers here are monitoring uh, the position of each and every tiger, and each and every tiger um, is, getting, uh, is getting protection. But... Very important transformation here, hard fencing. So traditionally we've looked at national parks as hard fence, that we make an area, we set it aside, and then we may put a fence around it, but we fence it with guards, people with guns, and with rules and regulations. It doesn't work. What we need is a transformation to social fencing. And social fencing is where the people themselves that surround the park feel sufficiently strongly about the values of the park that they support it themselves. They provide a social sense fence to go around that park rather than the guns of the park agency. So much of the work that I'm going to talk about is how do we move hard fencing to social fencing? And in this particular case, uh, in Sariska, there was also some relocation. Relocation uh, doesn't sound good, but it should do. I've said to many park agencies, when you are relocating, you have to have communities that were standing waving at you saying, let it be me, let it be me, because you are giving them the best deal you possibly can. You're not moving them to marginal lands. You're not moving where there's no support for them. You're giving them very good land and lots of support for a long time but often they don't do that. So we have to make relocation a desirable thing, not the worst thing. So let's skip from there to a quick trip to Cambodia, Virache National Park, um, which was being formed by the Cambodian government with the support of the World Bank. And there was interest in knowing what to do with the indigenous people in the area. And so the indigenous people are the Brow people. And the Brow people live deep in the forest. It's very inaccessible. That's why I showed going up the river. There were no roads uh, to get in there. And the Brow people are very ecosystem people, very much dependent upon that local environment and protecting that local environment. Uh, but they are, did I lose a slide there? No. But they are slash and burn agriculturalists. Uh, they make their living the same way as the Thai, Northern Thai people do and many other people, but their openings are not that large and they don't cut them very often and the population is very low. But they also have other attractions to the forest that they live in. So, for example, these are pine trees and they tap them for resin every year. 
and the pine trees are owned in a lineage by a family within the community. And so what we see here is sustainable tapping of a pine tree that will happen every year. Forest as guardian community, uh, forest as garden, community as guardians, because this is a sustainable activity and the people protect these trees. If they're not there, this is what happens. The tree gets burnt by a casual passerby, by a poacher, it gets overburnt and may in fact die from this wound. And so it's people looking after and protecting the forest here. But they said, we can't do it all. For example, there are some very valuable nuts there called Malvin nuts. And uh, when a tree comes with these nuts, it's worth a lot of money. And if a poacher is coming into that forest and he finds a Malvin nut tree, he's likely to cut it down just to get the Malvin nuts and get out of there. Obviously not a very sustainable activity. And they pointed this out as something where they would like some support in being guardians. And so what we found in this case was that it was a very enlightened community about the rights and responsibilities, what they could offer and the support that they needed. And they had a very forward looking and intelligent uh, leader uh, who was very instrumental in developing a conservation ethic amongst the, uh, the brown people. So these are some of the kinds of generic factors that we look at when we are considering uh, the rights of communities. For example, time. When was the community, how long has the community been in that area? Is it old? Is it pre-protected area? Or is it a new one that was created after the park was created? Why was it created? Is it created to support people in their livelihoods or is it created to produce a coffee plantation for one of the rich local politicians? And what's the impact? Is it low or are they having a big impact on the flora and fauna? So if communities are over here, then they're likely to get a very good hearing about the kinds of things that can be done uh, in terms of their existence in the forest. So let's change from the ecosystem people over there and switch over to the west coast of Thailand, the Andaman Sea coast. And we are going to talk about some of these islands here and then go up to Myanmar. So these islands here, such as Mukosarin Marine National Park, uh, some of the most beautiful in the world, uh, and they also have some of the best coral. Unfortunately, um, the coral was being dynamited, uh, resulting in scenes such as this. So we uh, had been working to try to increase the diving in the area to provide more protection for the, uh, from the, for the coral so that the people would get more money uh, from preserving the coral than from dynamiting it up. And this is one of my students uh, doing some of those coral surveys. But then in 2010, uh, we felt an even greater change. Uh, Thailand suffered the most severe bleaching uh, from raised sea temperatures and up to 90% of the coral died. So we started doing surveys about recolonization of the coral and where that was happening and how it was happening. And our conclusions led us to believe we are surveying these islands down here, that most of the replenishment was coming from the north, down from Myanmar. And just at that time, in 2015-16, Myanmar was opening up a little, and the International Union for the Conservation of Nature sponsored a, uh, an expedition up into these islands here, the Mayak Archipelago, 800 islands over about 400 kilometers to see what was left there in terms of conservation values. And I was invited to uh, join that expedition, which gave us opportunity to look at this replenishment idea. Well, we found replenishment, we found corals, and we were very happy at that. 
uh, we found fish, but only small ones. And in particular, we found uh, no sharks, which was a big surprise since we used to go diving up here 10 years before, and there were many sharks, and we saw very few uh, parrotfish. Now that was the main concern because the research coming out of the Caribbean, uh, which was warning that most of the reefs will be lost in the next 20 years uh, because they have lost their populations of parrotfish. And the parrotfish plays an important ecological role because it's a grazer on the coral. And as it grazes, it takes off the algae. And if the algae is not removed, the algae will suffocate the coral. And so parrotfish um, are essential for reef, reef health. And as this says here, the uh, reports from the Caribbean said the loss of parrotfish had been much more severe than the impacts of climate change on these reefs. So that was a concern for us. And so just Incidentally, the, my graduate student there, uh, Petsch uh, Manapawitra, he started a, a social media campaign because we had seen that parrotfish were coming for sale in, in many Thai supermarkets. And so he started a campaign against the supermarkets to stop people buying, which they did. And then the supermarkets stopped uh, buying the parrotfish. And so um, I'm not against social media campaigns. I think they can have a um, a, a very beneficial impact uh, when well thought out. But perhaps the greatest surprises in Myanmar came from the human uh, angle. So on the expedition, there were 10 marine biologists, a geographer, me, and an anthropologist, which was very lucky. So the people who mostly inhabit this area are the Mokan, sometimes called the sea gypsies. And they are traditional ocean collectors that live on their boats most of the year and then come to shore in the monsoon season for a few months before going out to live on their boats again. So essentially a very nomadic uh, existence. And so the authority on these people uh, was Pierre Ivanov and his son Jacques Ivanov. He wrote, he's, he's an anthropologist. And the latest news that we could get about the Mokan in Myanmar was from this book here, where Jacques Ivanov had been up through the Mayak uh, archipelago and he couldn't find them. He called them the will of the wisps. He'd find a few and then they disappear. He'd find a few and then they disappear. And he remarked upon their enduring ability just to keep moving and never settle down. So it was a great. Well, it was, a, it, was, it was a surprise to us when we found this village of sea gypsies uh, that was clearly a year-round uh, village, and we went in to talk to them. The anthropologists uh, spoke, their, uh, spoke their language, and they said uh, that they, their collecting had become very less fruitful, and they weren't able to survive anymore. And so they had come to shore as a more stable, uh, as a more stable existence. Um, and so I was talking to the headman, and I'm a sailor myself, and I said, gosh, you know, hundreds, thousands of years on your boats and you come ashore, that must have been a terrible thing for you. And he said, no, actually, you know, it worked out really well. And I said, you know, but forced to come ashore. And he said, well, he said, uh, said the ladies liked it better, you know. Happy wife, happy life. Uh, you know, you're cooking up shellfish all the time. It's much easier on the shore than being out on a boat all the time. There are all kinds of changes then happening in with the Moka. So moving on to shore, going from being collectors to being fishing. Here they are squiddy fishing. There was a school in the village where they were learning to read and write very uh, high illiteracy rates. It's only about 2% of the people are literate. Uh, influences, religious influences from outside. They are traditionally animist, but now a Thai monastery has created a missionary station uh, right next to the village. And missionaries of a different kind. The headman has a generator and he has a dish now and he's bringing in television. 
This is their supermarket, uh, mainly things for chewing betel, but also some modern things to put them in the mainstream. But our greatest surprise was this photograph. And the village was very pleased, uh, very proud with this photograph. It was the photograph of a girl who'd gone to the mainland and gone to school, to high school, and graduated and gone on to college and was going to come back to be a teacher. And we talked about this and it turned out that she was in fact of mixed parentage between the sea gypsies and the Karen people. We said, what? The Karen people? No, no, the Karen people live in the highlands. Remember, I talked about those when we started this talk. The Karen people live up here in the highlands. And what had happened is the Karen people, the highland people, they had got tired of the fighting uh, between their armies and the, the military government in Yangon. And a couple of villages had moved out onto these islands. So we have these two cultures uh, coming together um, in space that you would never think about. One settling down and the other moving down this uh, mountain chain into the same area. So we asked where the Karen village was and we were told and we went to visit it. It was a large prosperous village and we said, wow, this looks pretty good. I said, what do people do for a living? We talked to the school teacher. And she said, uh, well, they fish. We said, okay, what kind of fishing do they do? And she said, well, they're spear fishermen. So this was one of their boats. So um, this is the engine. This is an air compressor. And attached to this air compressor, there are four 120 foot long tubes. And what the Karen have learned from the Moken, some of the world's greatest deep divers of the Moken free diving, but the Karen uh, use these tubes to go down on the reefs at night to go spear fishing. And there's no helmet, none of that stuff. You just have a tube of air and you breathe it in, turn it over and fish and then throw it out. You can imagine there are very high mortality rates. So we said, okay. The next day when we were leaving, uh, when we got far, far from the village, we happened to run into where one of these boats had rendezvoused uh, with a fish trader's boat. And there we saw all the missing parrotfish. All the fish that we weren't seeing on the reefs were being caught by the Karen spearfishers. So one of the things that the, the way that the parrotfish uh, sleeps is they blow a mucus bubble around themselves and go to sleep on the reef at night. If you go down there on the reef at night, they're all asleep there. Uh, you've got your air, they have a long steel pole and they just go doop, 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 and they take all the parrotfish off the reef. Now they're not reading the literature, the scientific literature from the Caribbean telling about the impacts on the reef of, a carrot, of the parrotfish. They have no idea, but they did tell us that the catches were getting much reduced now. And so, well, what to do? Well, you can't, again, you can't tell just people to stop. You have to think about some of the strategies. Um, and we talked about various scenarios, what could happen. We talked about alternative livelihoods that I'm going to talk about in a little while some of these things, and about value chains. Most of the lobsters in Thailand have already been eaten, but you could catch lobsters up there that the fishermen got 50 cents for, and they were taken down to Phuket where you could get one for $80. So the question is, how do we get this value into these hands? And there's also room for a lot of capacity building, a very low literacy levels, uh, following this, I, I wrote some letters and to the NGO that's advising the government, uh, they invited me over. And since then, I've been back many times working on some of these issues that we talk back here. And once Myanmar opens up again, um, I will be back there again. So the cultural dimension, we need to understand cultures and their history. But we also need to understand that things change. The slash and burn agriculture system ground to a halt. 
The marine collecting and hunting of the Mogan ground to a halt and they had to change. We also have to understand that people change. People move. The Karen came down from the highlands to the islands. People stopped moving. The Mokan people settled onto land. So adaptability is good, but market-led change is often not optimal for sustainable futures. And developing sustainable livelihoods is key for effective conservation. So we've wrapped this into what we focus on mainly is called incentive-based conservation. And I borrowed this uh, diagram from the PhD of one of my very good graduate students, Jackie Ziegler, who put this into a, a format here, where we can see that by providing incentives for conservation, what we hope to do is change attitudes of the people to support conservation, that will change behaviors of those people, and that will lead to positive ecological conservation outcomes. So I'm just going to talk briefly about some of these things and getting us down to here. Particularly, I think I'm going to talk about tourism because it's been one of our main foci. So ecotourism, I'll run briefly through this. Uh, it's one of the most maligned and greenwashed terms we come across. I'll just give you these characteristics. It has to be nature-based. We shouldn't be doing any tourism that is non-sustainable, so it has to be sustainable. Ecotourism must go one step further. It's not just sustainable, it must have a positive benefit on conservation. And unless you can determine what that conservation is, that benefit is, it's not ecotourism. It must be educational, where people learn more about the environment and it must also be ethical. So this is an example from the African companies increasing lion populations, some of the communities in the Philippines um, from giant clams through to whale sharks, uh, something that we have worked on in some depths. So our goal in our whale shark program is to stop whale sharks having their fins sliced off, to go into restaurants and become more used for ecotourism purposes where they can generate more money than they could down here. So Jackie has led many of these studies, including this one in the largest whale shark tourism spot on the globe. And this is in uh, Cebu Island in the Philippines. It's different from all the others, in most of the others, in that it is um, a guaranteed opportunity to see whale sharks. You go, you will see, and you will see because they feed them. So this happened because Oslob was a small fishing village where they used to set their nets at night and the whale sharks would swim offshore. They would come through their nets and destroy their nets. So some of the fishermen uh, would be deployed to throw rocks and try to keep the whale sharks away from their nets. Then they discovered that they could actually lead the whale sharks away from the nets by feeding them with shrimp and the kinds of things that they normally eat. So they started leading them away. Then a dive resort owner over in the further down the coast said, do you think you could lead them down here a little bit? And they said, sure. So they got the idea of feeding the whale sharks and leading them around and making sure that they stayed so people can see them. And that's what these people are doing here. This guy in this panda here is feeding the whale shark. And these people are hanging on to this other panga and watching the whale shark through the water. So we did a lot of studies on this, all the economics and everything. But one of the things that most interested us was this, that see the paddle coming down here. This is from the fisherman in the panga who is feeding the whale shark. And the whale shark is swimming along behind the panga. He's paddling away like this. But he's also got his foot on the whale shark to stop him over tipping the panga. This is a big change because they have gone from things that come in the night and break down your nets. 
to something that you've got a tactile connection with in the water. And that suddenly doesn't become a whale shark, it becomes George. Where's George? Has anybody seen George today? There becomes a personal uh, connection with these animals in the water. Uh, and whether you like the feeding or not, uh, it signifies a change in attitude towards uh, fishing, extractive industries, the ocean, all kinds of things. So we've done quite a bit of work on how ecotourism, whale shark ecotourism, and also uh, marine protected areas, how over time they develop more intrinsic motions, uh, motivations for conservation, which is where you want to be, because they are more resilient than extrinsic motivation. When COVID comes and tourists can no longer come, if it's an extrinsic motivation for money, then they're going to go back to exploitive material uh, actions. But if it's an intrinsic motivation, they're going to keep going. So we try to generate, understand how those happen. Now, ecotourism is not a panacea. Uh, there are challenges all through, and I'm not going to go uh, into depth on these. Um, there are problems with management, and we have worked on some of these carrying capacity problems. And we found this around the world where ecotourism can be oversold. So it's not a panacea, but it can, where well managed, uh, create very significant conservation images. So I just have one final example, then a wrap up slide. So this is a study also in the Philippines by another one of my graduate students, Alessia Cockle, um, that was a, an exceptional piece of work working on the systematic, systematic design of marine protected area networks and trying to think about equity. And I'll explain to you what that is here. So systematic design of marine protected area networks. So what we would do is we would undertake marine surveys and we would find out where the best seagrass, where the best coral, where the best mangrove was. And then we would try to devise a protective system that in includes at least 20% of each one of these kinds of things in no-take areas. We would put all our results into a computer and it would spit out map after map after map saying, well, this would do it, this would do it, this would do it. Then we look at the various other things to see how our uh, MPA system might look. The problem is these are just biodiversity targets. There are no social targets in there. So the biodiversity optimum might be the worst for the people on the shore, but it doesn't give you that information. It might penalize one community, uh, totally shut it down, or one sector of the fishing community and leave others uh, untouched. And so what Alessia did, she supplemented these marine surveys uh, with social surveys in the communities, uh, participatory GIS workshops. She went to 90 communities and she had uh, one day workshops in them, uh, each one in Southern Leyte in, uh, in the Philippines, where they would tell what was the most important areas of the fishing for us to avoid in designating MPAs. Then she threw all the results into the algorithm and she showed that in fact, uh, you could avoid the, uh, you, you, you could establish the most important areas for the biophysical uh, characteristics and also avoid the most important fishing areas if you had all this data. And so it's, um, it made us happy. So this is where we start uh, wrapping up because this puts us on this continuum here at the bottom. It shows us how these kinds of goals can in fact be managed uh, together. And that's what we are searching for. But it would also be naive to think that all situations are like that. There has to be some, uh, there has to be some room for a compromise. Uh, do we really think that starting a winning campaign for residency 
with a 3.5% population growth rate. 3.5% population growth rate uh, would mean that there would be over 200,000 people in Gorongoro Crater by the year uh, 2038, compared with 8,000 originally. So there's some tough choices to be made there. And um, one thing that we are engaged with is a project with Maasai people uh, further north than Gorongoro. And they started conservation areas themselves and looking at management practices themselves. We didn't go there and said, you need to change. They already had this in mind and we're starting to look at how they could do things differently. And in our project uh, with several members of the geography department, uh, we are working on those kinds of adjustments now and uh, contacting, connecting Maasai people with First Nations people here in Western Canada. And we have our Maasai people over here to meet and we are taking First Nations people over uh, to Northern Tanzania to see how do we do culturally appropriate management that meets conservation goals as well as meeting livelihood uh, goals. So there are some positive solutions when people um, are, are flexible. So this kind of a system, instead of looking the biosphere people, just looking down the relocation, we also need to learn to look across and understand residency. And the ecosystem people, we don't just need to beat the drum and say, yeah, residency is the winner. We need to understand across this section down to relocation as well, biodiversity conservation down here. So we need to have some different perspectives. Now, today I've talked about the impacts mainly of the ecosystem people because that is what my research has uh, dealt with over this last 40 years. But make no mistake about it, that it is in the fact the biosphere people who are much more culpable in terms of our overall impact on the biodiversity uh, of this planet. And community conservation is not just for poor people, uh, it's for communities everywhere about how we can get involved in uh, conservation activities. So we have to do things differently. We don't just have to find uh, new ways of doing the milkshake. We have to think, do we really need the milkshake? So over my career, we've seen biodiversity collapse uh, research, which we used to focus on just species biology. But now we realize we need to look at the entire ecological system that embeds species, not just the endangered species, but understand the web of life. We also need to understand the people, their cultures, their values, beliefs, and particularly their livelihoods. How can they sustain themselves and meet their needs and their aspirations? How can we try to promote equity uh, in, within and between communities? And how do these things come together in the physical manifestation of communities uh, being in place? So really my story is one, I think, essentially of geography, about how do you understand these different places and how do you understand the environment and the cultures that come together, together there and how can we make for uh, more sustainable futures and gain greater understanding uh, of these situations. Thank you. Well, thank you, Phil. That was that was an excellent presentation on a significant and pressing uh, set of issues. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, we'll move on to some questions that have been submitted. Uh, one is in terms, you know, that model uh, you present with the ecosystem people and the biosphere people, uh, you present it as kind of like a loop, I think. Uh, could it also be seen as, uh, like perhaps cynically, as kind of a drift? Uh, I mean, historically, it seems that 
we've moved from like an ecosystem uh, people to mm -hmm. the biosphere people. Yeah. And it seems that to account for some of the uh, negative issues of the current, uh, you know, ecological system, the climate crisis and all that, you'd either want to slow that drift or perhaps reestablish it as a loop. Yeah, I think that's a fabulous idea. Do it. No, uh, that is because that is a, a, a very uh, a good uh, historical perspective to look on that and uh, linking that up, not as a dichotomy, but uh, putting that historical loop in there. I think it's a fabulous idea. So whoever asked that, yeah, do it. <laughs> I mean, that's a good idea, yeah. It's easier said than done, I imagine. Yes, it is. Uh, but it does provide some context for how we think about these things. So that was the idea. The model, that loop, was actually one that I produced in that paper on Doi Intanon, the early one that we did the work in the 1980s. And so you know, it's 30 years old. Uh, but it keeps coming back with resonance about how we can try to you know, get more flexibility in our thinking about how we deal with these problems and understand uh, you know, those impacts uh, that, that are coming forth. But I, I love that idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another one, uh, I think related to that, is that, uh, you know, with, with the ecosystem people, um, they tend to be fairly low density in terms of their space and their physical environment. Uh, and it seems to me like issues of population size uh, doesn't seem to be like a central element within uh, not just, you know, what you've been saying tonight, but the general, um, what would you say, the, the general concerns and, and thoughts related to the climate crisis. Now, it, is, is, is that a correct perception this this idea that population size you know it's kind of recognized but it's not seen as a central factor um it's a good complicated uh question i mean the perspective that i usually take on this um see the, the, the situation i've been dealing with here is because these peoples are in direct contact with wildlife on the day-to-day -day basis uh but overall the impact that I have in my lifetime on the, on the climate or biodiversity would be equal uh, to the whole uh, Maasai community in one village. And so one Canadian you know, he, he equals 300 Cambodians. And so uh, the population dynamic is there. It's something uh, that is challenging to address in terms of where we're at now. Uh, because a lot of the population control measures that were very successful um, have taken place. And that demographic transition now is meeting uh, some resistance uh, in some countries. Um, for example, in Tanzania, their president, um, their past president, uh, does not uh, encourage people to have more children. People is power. And so, uh, and so he didn't uh, think that there was any kind of... Uh, a population pressure going on there. So we usually look at it as being population multiplied by technology, uh, you know, equals, uh, equals impact. Okay. And so, but the yeah, population is still an important driver in, in, in parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, now, another question was, uh, does creating uh, national parks as wildlife sanctuaries make measurable impact on wildlife numbers and recovery? Like that was, uh, that was asked earlier in your presentation and you kind of touched on it with that, uh, you know, recovery of say the tigers and so on. Yeah. I think it was in Thailand. Yeah, uh, it was a good question. And the general answer is yes, now it does. So uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, there were still not the more enlightened management for parks that we have now. And so uh, things were not going as well. But since that time, for example, in Tanzania, uh, Gorongoro, for example, uh, has the last remaining population of black rhinos 
uh, in northern Tanzania, and the numbers have gone steadily up, despite the fact that other species have gone down, uh, the number of rhinos has, uh, has gone up in that, in, in that time. So um, again, Sarisca is an, uh, another example, the tiger reserve, there are now uh, over 20 tigers uh, alive and well in that, uh, in that reserve. And so if managed correctly, if managed sensitively, uh, uh, then, then they can be very effective. And that's why now we have these global movements for a minimum of 20% set aside in these areas and 30% 30, 30 by 2030. And so um, that is the current global goal. Yeah, well, it seems that uh, the idea is, is also reinforced by that example you had with Yellowstone Park and Bison. <laughs> that's right. Uh, again, I'm, uh, I'm going to call this talk sitting on the fence, but my wife didn't think that was particularly explicit. And so people love to beat up on for fortress parks, but they have offered us something in the past and there does need to be an element of that in some parks still. You can't completely do away with that element until you have your social set fencing in, in, in place. And so social fencing is definitely where we need to go. It's more resilient, it's more ethical, uh, all those kinds of things, but uh, we still need some elements of fortress park. Yeah, well, it seems like uh, in a number of areas, at least, uh, like poaching is is a pretty big issue. Well, it is. I say not for the Maasai, uh, it, it not, but in many areas in the Serengeti, um, you know, they reckon about 40,000 wildebeest get poached every year. Wow. That's a lot, but there's a lot of wildebeest. And so uh, is that of concern? Well, you know, I'd be pretty flexible on that. But if your poachers want to start knocking off black rhinos, then we've got a big problem. Yeah. And so it depends what is being taken, bush meat, and in Thailand, you know, I've uh, often with park superintendents, uh, we've talked about taking white, they're not supposed to hunt in the parks, but if they want to hunt certain species that are in, in, in good abundance, uh, then I think that helps bring value to the park and value to the people and doesn't threaten biodiversity. So you know, again, case by case basis. Uh, here's another question for you, a general one. Uh, in all your research, what gives you the most hope for the future of conservation? Oof, good question. Um, I was surprised and delighted by some of our results in the Philippines showing these intrinsic changes and motivations for conservation. And so when normally when we're trying to persuade people to have a marine protected area, we say, oh, you'll get more fish, you'll be able to sell more, you'll get more money. Uh, but we found out after you go back to a, an area after 25, 30 years and say, what are the benefits of the, of the park? Uh, they talk about values for future generations, uh, they talk about social capital building. They talk about it's the right thing to do. In other words, they talk about intrinsic motivation. And so I think that has been one of our, uh, one of my uh, happy thoughts is people uh, going from a utilitarian view uh, to extrinsic motivations to intrinsic motivations uh, that, that they get the buy-in uh, to protect and save uh, other creatures. Yeah, well, it's, it seems like there's uh, a lot of like critical balances that have to be kind of addressed whenever any of these initiatives are taken. And identifying the balances seems to be a real challenge. It is, absolutely. And so I hope that came through tonight. I'm a big believer mm -hmm. in a case by case basis. And even working with different Karen villages, they can have. Uh, different ways of approaching things and so you really have to understand the dynamics of what's going on in that particular area or that particular park to be able to um, suggest you know some of these uh, potential solutions. Now in conclusion uh, are you still engaged actively in research and if so what areas? Um, I'm still engaged in Myanmar as soon as that said, I've been writing the national uh, national marine uh, conservation policy for them and drafting some uh, uh, 
policy for, for legislation because they don't have those frameworks in place. The Mayek archipelago is like the Wild West. And so without those kinds of frameworks about how they're going to ultimately manage things, then there's going to be a very strong, going to be community-based, community-centric. And um, well, I say it's going to be, let's put it this way, the policy is, uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, how the Myanmar government uh, reacts um, to, uh, to that. Um, the preliminary feedback to say, okay, 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 okay. But then when you get down to the brass tacks of transferring power down the chain, uh, it kind of loses some of that initiative. So um, I'm still involved with that. I'm still involved with the Tanzania uh, project with the, uh, with the Maasai. Uh, and I'm still involved with various projects in, in, in Thailand. So you're retired, but not retired. <laughs> That's right. I'm on Salt Spring. What more do you want? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for, for uh, uh, joining in from overseas. Uh, it's been a delightful <laughs> evening and uh, your work is uh, significant and I hope it keeps on being successful. So thank you very much. Well, thanks very much for asking me, John, and thanks to all, all the people uh, watching this. And I'd uh, be pleased if you want to contact me uh, with any question. Thank you once again. And uh, for, for the audience, I just want to uh, uh, thank you for your participation and questions and remind you next week, next Wednesday at 7 on Zoom, uh, Leslie Saxon is going to do a presentation on grammar and place names, a site or linguist. I think that's lastly, uh, in Indigenous language revitalization. So hopefully we'll see you again next week. And again, Phil, thank you so much for a, a delightful evening. Thank you very much, John. Good night. Good night.